Sophie Knabner, and I welcome you to um, the panel um, of social protest movements. Um, I welcome you in the name of the organizers of this panel, that is to say the group around the topic thread, Global Justice. And I also welcome our moderator today, Natalie Nataboni. Um, Natalie lives and works in Rostock, um, a city uh, located in the north of Germany. And after a career in dancing, Natalie uh, joined the Swiss and German radio as a journalist and as a writer. And in her last work, she has extensively dealt with the history of East Germany, GDR. And today we are happy to have her here um, as a moderator for our panel. And yeah, with that, I um, hand over to you, Natalie, and wish everyone an inspiring discussion. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you for your little intro. I would like to welcome you very much and I'm very glad to be part of this panel. We will have like um, now, I think about around about 70, 80 minutes for our discussion. Social protest movements, milestone to global justice. And um, I would like to start uh, with presenting our four guests this afternoon and then maybe have a little discussion, a short discussion with each of our guests and then open it up. And we have Mia, thank you very much, Mia, who is taking care of the chat so that we can involve everyone into this discussion. And I would like to start, uh, present a very warm welcome for Yuhi Tiagi, who is talking to us from Bangalore in India. That's right. And um, Yuhi, you have a PhD in sociology, yes, <laughs> which is a quite difficult word for me to pronounce in German. <laughs> and you are now an assistant professor at the School of Development at the University in Bangalore. Um, and you have done a lot of researches about um, regions of political conflict in India. Um, and you have continued to work in this field and um, you are or you have been investigating how radical movements sustain themselves over time and their impact on wages and work conditions of labor. And as I know, you are currently starting a new research project and um, there I think you investigate in how networks between the poor and marginalized um, work and how they can impact their experiences of disaster. And I guess we will come back to that later, but more in the detail. And I'm very, very happy to have you with us. Thank you. Our second guest is Limbert Sanchez Tokwe. I hope I spell this quite right. And you are talking to us from Bolivia. And um, you are an educationalist and specialized in the field of sustainable development. And for the last 13 years, you have been working at the Centro de Ecología y Pueblos Andino in Oruro, in Bolivia. And you support the communities of, um, of people who are fighting against mining and um, were protesting against mining of the Swiss-based company Glencore. Is that right? Yeah. And um, we will come back to that also a bit later and to talk a bit more in detail about how this works and uh, what you have been achieving at this point now. And I'd like to, to welcome you very warmly, <laughs> Imbrit. Hello. Our next guest to present is Esther Muniangwe, who is talking to us from Namibia, from Wintuk, from the capital of Namibia. And Esther, you have been a social worker and you have been uh, in Germany in the last past 15 years quite several times, as I know, in your function as a chairwoman of the Overheverero Genocide Foundation. And you are a politician as well, and you've actually wrote history because you are the first woman to lead a Namibian party. That is right. And since March, 
<laughs> since since March this year, you are the Deputy Minister of Health and Social Services for the government. I'm very happy that you spent your time with us, Esther. Welcome. Thank you very much. And our last guest to present is Fahad. Hello, Fahad. Fahad, you are talking to us from Berlin. And um, you have been living in Germany since 1969. That is right. And you are the director of Pell Civil Waves, Civil Waves, which is an organization who, um, um, yeah, maybe you can tell us about a bit more, but you do projects in the border, in the Turkish Syrian border for young Kurdish people. Is that right, Fahad? Um, and maybe, Fahad, we can start with that, that you please explain us a bit more what the work of civil waves is like. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation uh, and for the introduction. Uh, just one one small thing. Uh, since 1996, not 69, I was not born at that time. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, that doesn't matter. <laughs> no, that's right. So thank you. Uh, Pell Civil Webs is actually an, an, um, an initiative. We uh, created this initiative um, by the beginning of the Syrian uprising 2011. We asked us uh, as Syrians abroad how we can contribute, how we can support the people inside Syria as they began to protest against the, uh, the, the regime, the, the, the dictatorship in, in Syria. And so we, we, we developed this initiative and we decided to support them, uh, just giving them a voice in the media, for example, sending them sometimes money or technical support, sending them some laptops, um, some iPhones. And uh, as we, we saw the, the protest movement will not win the struggle in just a few months, we asked us again how we can go with our work now. As we saw how, how brutal the regime was and how difficult for the social movement actually was to um, organize themselves. So we decided to go inside Syria and to build teams inside Syria and to create centers to uh, have some direct influences on the, uh, you know, on, on the movement inside Syria. Uh, we created uh, centers. We have now around six different centers in mainly two uh, parts of Syria, in the north and eastern part of Syria in the province of Raqqa, which is very known actually as mm -hmm. Raqqa was the, the second capital of uh, ISIS, of the Islamic Caliphate, uh, and also in the second province in Al Hasaka, which is mainly Kurdish dominated uh, center. We, in our work, we are not focusing on one ethnic or social group. We are trying to reach all the marginalized groups. We are trying to empower young people, women, but also create a platform for dialogue between the the different social groups, the different ethnic and religious groups. We have Christians, we have Muslims, we have Yazidi, we have the different uh, Christians' confessions, for example, among the, the Christian uh, uh, society in Syria. The same uh, for, for the Muslims, but also we have the tribes, we have uh, good educated people, we have less educated people, we have uh, very um, uh, strong woman, but you have also women who still in need to be supported to to have uh, like a way to go and to um, to create some ch chances for them to be involved and to uh, participate in the social and in the political movement in this area. So this is actually our work. We are trying to design different. Uh, projects, activities, and among those, and through these activities and projects, uh, giving those all marginalized group uh, the place they need to be seen from, you know, the local authorities, from the regime, and from the broader society. Okay, Fahad, thank you very much. Was there any kind of social protest movement before 2011 in Syria? Is there a history of social protest movements in, in, in Syria? Well, the, the, you know, the Ba'ath Party, which is still ruling uh, the country in Syria, uh, took actually the power in, in 1963. 
So, uh, and beginning from that time, uh, the Syrians tried actually to, to create movements, political movements, social movements. Uh, uh, they were students who went to the street and demonstrated for some rights. There were also women, lawyers, uh, different, different sectors. But the regime from the first day was so brutal and also was successful to uh, really destroy all the movement who, who, who tried actually to exist and also to extend. We have always in Syria movements, uh, we had movements, but all those movements were actually more local movements. Mm -hmm. So they were, for example, in the capital, in Damascus, but we are not able to reach the periphery in another sides of, of Syria. They were, for example, ethnically uh, focused, focused on the Kurds, maybe on the Druze or on other groups, but we're, we're not able to reach another groups. The same for religious. We had in the 18s, for example, a big political and social movement, but there was like uh, there was an, an, an Islamic movement, mm -hmm. and not a general movement for all the Syrians. And this movement was not able to reach all of the Syrians, but for all the movement, for all the, 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 the protest movements, the, the, the reaction of the regime was the same. The brutality, uh, he has killed thousands of people, thousands of students, of academics, of, of very motivated young people, and he put thousands of Syrians in jail. We lost more than 100,000 people inside the prisons in Syria. We are not, we are not able to, to, to know anything about their fate, actually. What happened with them? Mm -hmm. Are they still alive or they, they did? Where is their body, for example? And this is like the trauma, that it was the trauma for the Syrian as they start the new movement with a new generation. Uh, they got also like uh, influenced by the movement in, in Tunisia and in Egypt at that time in Libya and they start uh, a new movement. And the result we are seeing actually what happened in Syria. It's clearly um, civil war, a very fragmented country, very fragmented movement, very fragmented society, and uh, the future is completely unclear. Thank you, Fahad. Wow, what a beginning. Um, I would like to um, talk um, to you, to you, because I think um, in India you have a complete um, different um, situation in terms of um, I can imagine that there is a history of social protest movements in India. Can you, of course, um, Mahatma Gandhi is the first one who comes in our minds, but um, there has been, I, I researched a bit and I saw that there has been others um, who were very strongly. Can you please tell us something um, about that? Thank you, um, and thanks. I'm really glad to follow um, what Farhad said. Um, so I think we have had a less brutal um, regime for most of it than the Syrian one, especially you know compared to the Assad regime. Um, and so we have had quite a few diverse social movements, and we've had a really long history of them, like you said, starting with Gandhi. But I think what people don't realize is the diversity of movements that we have so apart from having with, you know, I think Fahad also said, which is having identity movements, which um, have now more and more become popular, right? You have the LGBTQ plus movement, you have the women's movement. You have a lot of these sort of movements, but what we also have a big tradition of is traditional working class movements, which brings in a lot of groups that I think Fahad talked about, which is not just based on one, ethnic group um, or one caste group as we have in India, which is divided into you know, several caste groups socially. So we do have a really long history. And the one that I specifically have been working on, in fact, um, is a radical movement, which of course was influenced by the Maoist movement in China. And that has been around since the late 60s, and it is around even today. So you're talking about a movement that's been there for the last 14, 50 years. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was intrigued by something like this, right? Mm -hmm. How is it that you have movements that can go on for so long, especially when, you know, the government or um, the sort of mainstream media talk about it, 
they speak about it in terms of, um, you know, in very reduced terms, they usually talk about it being a very coercive movement about it because it is unlike the Gandhian movement, it's much more a class-based movement, it's mm -hmm. much more sort of radical, much more militant in its um, modality and form of struggle. And so the question becomes, how is it that a movement that is so coercive, according to the government, can last so long? And that's what I have been studying for the last 10 years now, is to understand where these sort of movements have done well and what are the reasons that they've survived for so long in some regions in the country. And what are the re reasons why they survived for such a long time? So again, actually going back to the Syria example, and I think this really connects, connects up very nicely, um, what really seems to matter. So I looked at regions as a sociologist. What I did is I compared three different regions. I looked at places where you had the movement surviving for a long time. I looked at some regions where you had the movement on and off, and some regions where you didn't have the movement at all. And the only factor, one of the main factors that resulted in the movement lasting for a long period of time is honestly just very patient, slow, political building of the working class. So really trying to slowly build up working class sort of identities um, where they slowly take on struggle and giving them some kind of, you know, sort of radical democracy with it. So all of these little villages or little towns then have their own sort of little movements which come together under an umbrella movement but they also have some amount of autonomy to make decisions because each village has different class structures, different things they're fighting against. And you have to allow these movements to understand their political economy or where they are operating and make some decisions. So when you think of the Arab Spring, for instance, that Fahad talked about, what everyone talked about was the tweets that happened in Egypt, right? About how big that was in leading to the movement. But I think what enough people don't talk about was how that was equally complemented by very, very strong, um, strong union organizing that had been happening in Egypt for years before that. And that really did help in what came to be known as the Arab Spring. And that's the same case in the movement I saw, the slow, rigorous sort of organizing politically um, is what really pays off in the long run. And then, of course, giving autonomy and letting these movements take some decisions on their own. So did I understand it right that in the Arab Spring, as well as in the researches that you did, the unions did actually play a very important role to build like the seed um, from where it was growing? Is that? Yes, absolutely. You got that right. Okay, thank you very much. It's very interesting. I didn't know. Um, Limbert, hello. <laughs> hello, Limbert. Um, I would like to ask you if you could um, please tell us what are the problems that indigenous people are facing in Bolivia in um, um, with Glencore. That maybe we just shortly get an idea of what the real problems are that you're facing at the moment and what is the point that you are now at the moment um, with this Swiss-based big player. Buen día. Eh, en principio, eh, yo trabajo en, en Oruro, en Bolivia. Eh, trabajamos con comunidades eh, que están afectadas por la contaminación minera. Eh, y eso es una realidad aquí en Bolivia y en Latinoamérica. Grandes empresas transnacionales están explotando eh, nuestros recursos naturales. Y eh, Bolivia, desde 1535 años, 
ha sido un país que ha estado aportando muchos recursos naturales a Europa, a Estados Unidos. Hoy vemos con mucha tristeza, eh, muchas comunidades están seriamente contaminados, agua contaminada, eh, suelos que ya no sirven para lo que es la producción. Y nuestra preocupación es grande porque aquí en Bolivia, como en Perú, Colombia, eh, Brasil, muchos defensores eh, del medio ambiente están, eh, están siendo asesinados, están siendo perseguidos. Y esa es una de las preocupaciones grandes que tenemos. Eh, nosotros estamos trabajando en consolidar movimientos ambientales desde los niños, desde los jóvenes. Y eso es nuestra realidad. Vemos también, por un lado, que eh, nuestros pueblos indígenas, ¿no? de lo, los pueblos indígenas, tienen su propia filosofía, tienen su propia identidad. Queremos nosotros también, eh, y estamos trabajando con muchos pueblos indígenas, para fortalecer, para poder darles esa, eh, esa autonomía, esa libertad, porque desde hace mucho tiempo siempre han sido discriminados, el racismo, la discriminación es fuerte eh, en, en Bolivia, como muchos países, y nosotros es, reivindicamos la cultura, y por eso en el trabajo que hacemos nosotros, en nuestras realidades, impulsar un movimiento ambiental que defienda la vida, que defienda el agua, que defiende el medio ambiente, pero desde la identidad, de, desde las comunidades locales, desde su cultura, desde su cosmovisión. Hoy el mundo necesita no un, un modelo lineal, necesita un, un modelo más diverso, reconocer la diversidad, valorar nuestra diversidad de cultura, nuestro ecosistema. Entonces estamos eh, trabajando y, y nuestra realidad es cada vez más crítico porque hay muchos defensores que están siendo asesinados, perseguidos por la justicia y el interés de las empresas transnacionales cada vez es mucho más fuerte de poder saquear nuestros recursos naturales. Entonces, trabajamos en eso con muchos jóvenes, con muchos niños para defender la vida. Ich würde jetzt konsekutiv dolmetschen. Ähm, guten Tag, ich freue mich sehr, hier zu sein. Ich arbeite in Oruro, in Bolivien, mit verschiedenen indigenen Gemeinschaften und wir engagieren uns gegen die Bergbauverschmutzung, die hier eine große Realität in Bolivien und in Lateinamerika insgesamt ist. Große Firmen beuten hier die natürlichen ähm, Rohstoffvorkommnisse aus. Seit 1535 werden viele natürliche Rohstoffe nach Europa und in die USA exportiert. Entschuldigung, ganz kurz nur. Mhm. Entschuldigung, ähm, können wir auch eine Übersetzung auf Englisch haben? Weil ich glaube... Ähm, das müsste dann über den englischen Stream kommen, aber sonst kann ich es auch so probieren. Ja, gerne, bitte. Ah, ja, 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 gerne. So, dass, dass äh, Juhi auch etwas... Ähm, Versteht und Esther auch. Ja, danke schön. Vielen Dann Dank. Dann ich nochmal. Und es muss nicht vollständig sein, aber ja. danke. Vielen Dank. Super. Okay. So, hello to everyone. Um, we are working in Oruro in Bolivia um, and we work with indigenous communities against the uh, pollution because of the mining, which is a big rea reality in Bolivia and in Latin America in general, because um, big uh, businesses come here and exploit natural uh, resources, beginning from the year um, 1535, and they exported them to Europe and the USA. So um, the problem is that uh, the environment is polluted, that the uh, the soil and the water gets polluted, and we are very concerned about that, not only in uh, in Bolivia, but also in Peru, Colombia, and Brazil. And uh, we create movements for children and for young people amongst the indigenous communities. We help them to create their own identity and we work uh, with these um, communities in order to give them autonomy and uh, liberty. 
and um, the racism and discrimination are very strong in Bolivia. So we as an environment movement want to defend life. Uh, we want to defend the water and also uh, the people themselves. And we want to preserve our culture. We think that we need um, different um, approaches. We need diverse forms of movement. We need to um, help save our environment, our ecosystems, and um, our um, our communities. And um, we are especially concerned because the big businesses keep exploiting our lands. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask you, are you working together? Are you networking? Linda, me gustaría preguntarte si os está. Are you working with uh, organizations, networking with organizations outside of Bolivia? And how, if yes, how are you networking with organizations to actually support your aims? For instance, with Swiss organizations when it comes to plant power. Eh, no logré la si me pueden traducir al, al español, por favor. Uh, so I will do the translation in Spanish for Limbert. Uh, there is some problem with the screen. Uh, Limbert, ¿me escucha? Sí, sí. sí. Um, la pregunta es eh, de qué manera se están organizando ustedes con otras organizaciones de fuera de Bolivia que les ayuden a perseguir sus objetivos de lucha contra Glenco. Eh, nosotros, eh, con el trabajo que hemos hecho, estamos organizándonos las comunidades que están afectadas se están organizando para poder articularse. Tenemos una organización que trabajamos eh, con comunidades y organizaciones de Perú, de Colombia, de Argentina, de Bolivia y Chile para poder denunciar a las empresas transnacionales como el caso de Glencore. Las comunidades aquí están ya cansadas. Est y hay un movimiento ambiental grande en Colombia, en Bolivia. Y eh, la fuerza del gobierno, en vez que apoya a las comunidades, el gobierno apoya a las transnacionales. Entonces también aquí eh, nuestro enemigo también es el gobierno. Que, se, eh, que de alguna forma hace caso a las transnacionales. Entonces eh, estamos articulándonos. Y este tipo de eventos también es muy importante para nosotros, de que nuestra lucha sea conocida, de que nuestra lucha por la vida, por el agua, sea pues una, una lucha de todo el mundo. Hoy tenemos que ser frente a las empresas transnacionales que lo que quieren es mantenernos en un dominio de nuestros recursos naturales y de la economía. Yo creo que es hora de que nuestros pueblos indígenas los pueblos indígenas originarios puedan retomar sus modos de vida, sus modos de pensamiento, su religión, su modo de desarrollo y su lengua. Entonces, tenemos que apuntar a un modelo diverso, no a un modelo lineal donde las empresas transnacionales y en alianza con el gobierno no van a seguir saqueando, donde va a haber más pobreza y riqueza para las empresas transnacionales. Entonces, hay una articulación en Bolivia de muchas organizaciones a nivel de Latinoamérica de la misma forma y lo que queremos es que este movimiento sea a nivel mundial, un movimiento por la defensa de la vida, del agua, para nuestras futuras generaciones. Yes, we are organizing uh, different movement strategies as an organization which works in Peru, Colombia, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile against the international businesses like 
Glencore, but we have to admit that um, we are um, we we are tired. We cannot struggle anymore because uh, the government support the transnational businesses, and uh, we want to speak up against that. So events like this event are very important for us because uh, we really want to make our case known in the world that we struggle for water, we struggle for life, and we want to take back our ideas, our religion, our language, and uh, we think that a diverse model, a diverse approach is very important because uh, we don't want these transnational businesses anymore, we don't want any more poverty, and um, we uh, want to work all together and create a global movement. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. I would like to move uh, to you, Esther, because actually you have a lot, a lot of experience uh, in this um, field. Just to get to know a little bit um, of your perspective, that's why I would wanted to talk with everyone, with each one of you um, first a little bit to get to know your perspective better from which you are entering this panel. Um, can you please tell us, I read that, that actually at the moment there was on the 11th of August, um, your, it was something happening in the, uh, in the case of um, the Herero and Namas. And um, can you please tell us shortly what the point is and what you have been fighting for the last 15 years? Thank, thank you very much, um, Natalie. Thank you also. It was nice to listen to the previous speakers. I'm delighted to be part of this uh, discussion. Of course, what I will talk about is something that happened <laughs> many years ago. It happened more than 100 years ago. I think it's now 150, 116, 117 years ago. And many people still do not understand why are we talking about something that happened so long time back now. Now, it is important to understand that Namibia went through multiple colonialism. In the 1800s, that is when the Germans came to Namibia. That was after the uh, well-known Berlin Conference of 1884-85. So they stayed in Namibia up to 1921 and so when Namibia was given to um, the, the British and from the British to South Africa. Now, what I will talk about is during the time of the Germans, that is between the period of 1904, 1908, something happened. There was war between the Germans and the uh, Herero and Nama people. But in, within that was something else happened or took place and that is what we call the genocide. And um, the Herero and Nama genocide is considered to be the first genocide of the 20th century, but yet not well known. So we never talked about this because immediately when South Africa took over Namibia, the focus was more on liberating Namibia from South Africa. So the struggle was on freeing Namibia from the occupancy of South Africa. That is only after independence that the two communities, especially the Nama and the Herero community, started to reflect on what happened. Because during that genocide, a lot of um, atrocities took place. There were two extermination orders that were issued by the Germans against the Herero and Nama people. 80% um, of the Herero people died or were killed, while 50% of Nama people were killed. So when we started in 2003, we said in 2004, the extermination order of Lothar von Trotter would mark 100 years. And so our fight was really a community based initiative. It's a civil, it's a movement started by the communities themselves. And they wanted to reflect 
on who they are today and what, what is the cause of their socioeconomic situation today. So after the commemoration in 2004, then the focus shifted on, but of course, Germany committed a, a, a genocide and hence they need to take re, uh, full responsibility for what they did. The same responsibility that the German government has taken upon themselves to repair the damage they caused to the Jewish communities. So that is the struggle that we have for now. Our struggle may be, it's also different from the previous speakers in the sense that these are two indigenous groups, ethnic groups that have put up um, not a fight, I would not say a fight, but that um, trying to engage the German government to, to take full responsibility for what happened. So in the past 15 years, what happened was we needed to have terms of references or four pillars that were guiding us in our work. The first one was, and which is very important, was to create awareness and to educate because as I said earlier on, not many people knew about the genocide that took place in Namibia in 1904. So it was necessary for us to create awareness. And I, I'm happy and I'm proud to say that we succeeded in creating that awareness, not only in Namibia, but in Africa and also globally. The other pillar was we have our people because of the extermination order who fled Namibia, their parents or ancestors fled Namibia because they were afraid of being killed. So they were born in South Africa and as well as in Botswana. That means that we have Herero, we have Nama people who are living in the diaspora, especially South Africa and Botswana. And it was important also for us as a movement to reach out to them because many of them have lost their culture. They cannot speak their uh, vernaculars. They have lost uh, their identity because they have been absorbed in the communities either in South Africa or Botswana. So that was necessary. And we also succeeded in that one because every year we visit one another. Either we come together in Namibia, South Africa, or in Botswana to have a commemorative event where the stories are being told and where they also learn their culture. The other one was to internationalize the, the, our fight and also to, or the movement, and also to solicit support uh, and build bridges with our solidarity groups in many other countries. Something that we also can say with proud that we have managed. We have a lot of um, solidarity groups and friends in most of the countries. And uh, the last one, which is the last pillar, which is also now something, a thorn in the flesh, is the reparation from the German government. We have been, um, and, and, and most of our work is not being done or carried out in Namibia, but we thought that it, it's necessary to do most of the demonstrations, most of the um, taking up uh, the streets or having uh, media briefings in, in Germany, in various cities of Germany, because that was necessary, necessary for us to create more awareness in Germany for them also, for the ordinary German men and women to understand why the Herero and Nama people are demanding reparation from the German government. Um, Natalie, maybe I can stop here. Thank you very much, Esther. I, I, thank you very much. I'm thinking of the bridges that you men mentioned. You know, when I think of what Limbert told us actually. So of course the bridges were to Germany and it was very important to get support and to get the awareness there and to have the support as well there. Was there other countries in which you had those bridges and you got this support except Germany? For that question, yes, very well. We have um, 
build bridges and solidarity groups in France. There are two groups. Uh, there is also um, a foundation, I cannot recall the name now, uh, but this is a Jewish foundation, which we also have linked up with them. And um, two years ago, they also assisted the foundation financially in order for the foundation to carry out its work. We have built um, solidarity or breaches also with um, uh, various groups in Brazil. Um, two years ago, also members of the movement went to Brazil where they also made uh, presentations on, on their movement. We have uh, made breaches also with um, the, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a group in, 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 in the UK. They have uh, on the 1st of August every year, they have what they call reparation work in, in London. So we have uh, built uh, linkages with them as well. The past two years, we have been sending people there to be part of that um, reparation work as well. We have built bridges in Tanzania. That is very important because we know that Tanzania was also a colony of, uh, of, of Germany. And um, they are also in the process of uh, structuring and regrouping themselves and see how they can also demand um, compensation from Germany. We have um, not uh, at the organizational level, but at personal levels, we also have uh, friends in, 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 in Benin. Benin is a very small country next to um, Nigeria. Then, of course, in South Africa, Botswana, the United States of America, of course, because in the, in the United States of America, we have an association also, which is also doing the same work that we are doing here, as well as in Botswana and South Africa. So we have uh, formed quite um, um, linkages with various uh, countries as well, yeah. Great work, great work to do this. Um, just before before we move on and we open up the panel a bit, I would like to ask you what what at which point are you at the moment when it comes to reparations with Germany? Um, it, it, that that one is, is is so complicated to explain. When the two groups started as uh, indigenous groups, our Namibian government, for example, was not involved. But in 2006, there was a motion moved in the Namibian parliament that supported the issue of genocide and the demand for reparation. So what is happening right now at the moment is that we have two dichotomies. We have two groups that are running parallel. We have um, the Namibian government initiative where they the, the government is talking to the German government. So this is government to government. Now the indigenous groups, they feel like it should not be like that. It should be uh, a, a participatory process. And um, Germany should not be told that because they ought to know better than everyone else. Because when you also think about the, the claims conference in Brussels, when they started to negotiate with the Jewish. The, the Jewish were represented by uh, 23 groups from all over the world. And then the, the discussions or the negotiations that took place, it was like a, a tripartite where you had the German government, the state of Israel, and the 23 groups that were representing the Jews. So we are saying, why can't we follow the same model where we can have our Namibian government at the table, the German government at the table, and representatives of the two groups, the Herero and Nama groups, also at the table so that they can speak for themselves. Because we, why we are saying that is because we also have the, the UN uh, principles or declaration 
on the rights of the indigenous people, which is very clear that uh, indigenous people should also be part of the process and they should navigate the process. They should influence the outcome of that process. So at the moment, we are not at that point where we can say we have a, a tripartite. At the moment, it's a government to government, which is making the Herero and the Nama people not happy about that process. So because of that, they, they have now also a court case in a, in a New York uh, district court where the aim is for the, 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 the New York uh, court to make a ruling of uh, involving the Nama and the Herero people. Because that is for us is very important. Because when we take the model of the Jewish, for example, when they signed the agreement, there were two protocols. There was protocol number one, which was now the agreement between the German government and the state of Israel. And protocol number two, which was the agreement between the Jewish and the German government. And that is the model that we want to see also because during that time of war, um, other communities in Namibia were also affected. And that could be what the Namibian government would negotiate on behalf of them. While the two groups that were targeted by the extermination orders then would also be at the table and talk on their own behalf. So at the moment, this is where we are, government to government, but also the other, the two groups having their court case in New York. Esther, that must be a very challenging situation for you in your position, in your like double role, isn't it? Yes, of course, um, being one leg in the government since March, and one lack in part of the community that was exterminated for the lack of a better word. It, it, it's difficult, but it's also not that challenging because um, in my work, it's also about social justice because being a deputy minister of health and social services is to render services to people, is to make sure that the livelihood of people is being taken care of. So it's not that much challenging because I know when to wear which hat. So when I'm in my work, it's, it's social justice. People should have access to services. The livelihood of people should be improved. When I put the head of the genocide uh, um, of, um, movement, it is also social justice because when the damage is being repaired, we, we, we are talking about social justice. So it's difficult, but it's also, one just need to, how, to know how to manage the two and also to, to know what are the limitations, where are the boundaries, when do I need to say what, when do I need, don't need to cross the boundaries. So at the moment, I, I'm still, I'm doing very well, I would say, because I can manage uh, and, and I know where are the boundaries. And of course, when this uh, position of deputy minister was offered, I, I, I was thinking about how would this influence my work in the movement also. And, um, you know, sometimes in life, one also needs to take decisions that are not always popular, but you, then you listen to your conscience. And uh, I remember that, uh, as you said in my introduction, that I'm also the, the, the leader of a political party. Now, last year when I was campaigning for a position in the Namibian parliament, my campaigning theme was restoring the dignity of the Namibians. So when I was given the position of the deputy minister, I thought that would have been the best opportunity for me to restore the dignity of the Namibians. I thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. Thank you. Ferhat, I would like to um, open it up a bit and um, just to 
discuss with each other and then maybe later to ask what is coming from the chat and maybe there are some comments and some questions. But that if you look at, um, at Syrian protest movements now or in the past years, like what kind of support are they getting from organizations outside of Syria? Can you tell us something about that? How is the networking outside of the borders? Yeah, I mean, uh, networking um, is one of our main uh, um, work actually with all our activity, uh, especially for us as a group uh, who, that are living abroad and have the access to, to, other, to another groups and can make some um, some relationships with other organizations. Uh, our donors are, uh, all of them are actually from the Western countries, from Germany, from Netherlands, from the US and other countries, France. So the, there is actually a kind of networking. They are also supporting us in advocacy. Uh, we are planning with them some campaigns, uh, developing strategies, uh, focusing on certain points. Uh, it's up to the international developments uh, regarding Syria. It's up to the political process, which is actually going on in Geneva with the UN. And we, we got a lot of support, of technical support from our uh, partners abroad, from our European partners, but also from uh, Canadians, from uh, American partners who um, uh, actually transferred a knowledge which was a very new for us. Uh, as, a, as people who had some experience in, in different countries, I'm talking about our partners, they came to us with this knowledge and transferred it to us through workshop, through training, but also through online meeting if uh, it, it didn't work uh, with, with, uh, with a travel to the region. We got also some uh, sponsored uh, scholarship, for example, for our, uh, for, our, for our team inside Syria. We sent some of them to Lebanon, to another countries. They did some study. They uh, participated on also different workshop and trainings in, in, in other countries. They um, learned a lot and they transferred this knowledge again to the local population. And this is the kind of actually the support we are, we are getting. Uh, of course, there is also material support. They are supporting our uh, um, activity, our projects uh, uh, through the, you know, the donation, but also supporting us with, with their access, with knowledge, with networking, with taking us and our voice and our cases, our demands to the international arena, which is very, very crucial and important for us. Thank you very much for that. that. And if you imagine a corporation, just let's just be <laughs> utopia, <laughs> utopia um, between civil waves and the Overhead Genocide Foundation. How could you imagine, for instance, a corporation like that where both organizations could benefit from it? I mean, when, when I was listening, um, uh, actually two, two main words was very present, very, very present in, in the Syrian context as well. Injustice, because it's justice, but also dignity and seeking for a life with, with dignity. As the Syrian began their uprising in 2011, they call it uh, the dignity uprising because they were thinking we lost our dignity. You know, it is a brutal regime who was running this country for more than four decades doing everything with this country and with the people of the country as if it be like an, an, an you know, a cat or an animal actually, or something uh, belonged to this regime and to the family of the president. And they were on the street and they were uh, crying and demanding the back of the dignity, not other political demands. They were not, for example, seeking for like a political transition or a new president, a new minister, or new uh, like in governance. The, the normal people in the periphery, in the, in the villages, in the small towns, they were on the street and were telling the, the, the government, we are seeking for our dignity. Give it back to us. We want uh, to live without a fear, without having like uh, a fear when, when we are at home. 
we are dreaming we are dreaming from the brutality of the uh, uh, intelligence services in Syria we want to live this life and we have we want to create a utopia for our time in our time not waiting for decades again to have a utopia we we, we are in need for now and uh, also the justice, for example, and this experience, how they, they get it in Namibia, how they organize themselves, how they uh, they create like a platform or networking, how they were able actually to influence the government and how they, uh, the new, uh, for them, for us, it's a new, a new experience, how they deal with this responsibility to be suddenly a part of the government. We are not still not at this stage. We are still like an opposition and uh, unrecognized opposition in underground. We are seeking for, for very, very uh, elementary actually rights. But in Namibia, they are uh, somehow in the government. They are in the parliament. They are deputy ministers. And this, this you know, experience is very useful to learn how they deal it about it, you know, um, about this point, because uh, the experience in the in the neighboring countries of Syria, and Iraq, for example, or in Lebanon, is different. The the former uh, social movement or the leaders of the social movement, who became suddenly ministers or uh, members of parliament, the, after a very short time, they became also corrupted minister and corrupted uh, member of parliament. They were not representing the social movement uh, anymore. So the people lost also the trust in the social movement. And this is a very dangerous uh, moment, actually, how we can survive if we will get this chance to be a part of the power in the, in the country, not only for the time uh, working on the ground and working as an as a, uh, opposition. Thank you very much, Fahad. Esther, I would like to, because that's a very interesting point, as you said that you were looking how the Jewish, I mean, you had like a kind of an example and a goal where you want to go and how you want to be this process done. And so now Farhat um, put up a very important point. What do you think? How did that work in Namibia? You can, I mean, you are the example. Very much, and Fahad, uh, you made a very in the, uh, important remark. And I want to, before I come to the question, I want to, 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 to inform you also that believe you me that um, being in this position, it's not uh, popular to everyone in Namibia. It's not popular to everyone with whom I was working in the in the movement because now the 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 the, the perception is that. I might be absorbed by the government and that will make me not to be as active as I have been in the, in the movement. So that is also another challenge that, uh, that I'm having because it's not only uh, other people who think that, but even people with whom I have been working are also of the opinion that uh, I, my mouth is now silent. There is no way I can talk about the the, the, the issue of, of genocide. Um, so it's a challenge and I'm still, it's too early for me to say. And uh, at the moment, I'm still talking about it. So I, I, I want to see what the experience would, would be as I move on in my new position that I'm having now. So that is uh, the, 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 my response to what Fahad uh, has just mentioned. And, um, what we, where we want to be is, is very clear. Um, it's very clear. This is something that happened more than 100 years ago, as I have said. And um, we have started to push for it now 16, 17 years. And um, we don't want another 100 years to come and we are still talking about it. That is why it is so important for the both government, the Namibian government, as well as the German government to understand the importance of making it a participatory process and not having it as a government to government because if we have it government to government it will not solve the problem. So which means that the two groups will still continue 
And that is not for how long are we gonna, you know, be in this fight. That is why it is important that we have the model that is there. There are international tools and framework within in which we can work. And we, we just need to, to come there. We need to, to influence one another to understand. And one more important thing that I think the two governments is, is not getting or is the fact that we talk about trauma. Some people think trauma that happened 100 years ago is forgotten. It's not. Because if you read trauma books, there is something that they call transgenerational trauma, which has been transformed from one generation to the next. So, and if I'm saying today that we have people who cannot speak their language, we have people who have lost their culture today, that is a reminder of what happened more than 100 years ago. So the German government, for example, they want to say that the Herero genocide and Nama genocide happened before 1948 convention of the UN which is not true because as much as it is not the case, it's the same with the Jewish. Because when the Holocaust happened, it was also before the 1948, but they have acknowledged that. The same with the Armenian genocide, the same German government, which is saying that the Herero Nama genocide happened before the 1948. They acknowledge the, the Armenian genocide, which took place in 1915 as well. So you, you have this um, um, not seeing the German government being serious. And the other thing that I want people also to understand is that our, our movement, it, it's targeting not the Namibian government, it's targeting the German government because the, 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 the genocide was committed by the Germans, not by the, Gen the Namibian government. So that is also a distinction that people should make that our fight is against the German government because their ancestors are the ones who committed genocide against our ancestors. The German government wants to say that, but you are not direct victims. So don't compare your genocide with the Holocaust because the Holocaust, they were surviving uh, uh, victims. We, we, we are direct victims. The poverty that we are in today, politically we were affected if 80% of the people were killed. So we are in a minority today. What does it mean to be in a minority? You are not in all the decision-making structures. So th these are some of the things that we are also um, advocating about for the world and the German government to understand why and why we are demanding reparation today for something that happened more than 100 years ago. The land is gone. Where is the land? The land is in the, most parts of the lands are in the hands of the Germans uh, who also inherited it from their forefathers. They are saying we inherited it, but where did their forefathers get the land? So these are all the issues. And um, we cannot solve this issue without the involvement of the two groups. And we are always saying that if the Jewish could have been represented by 23 groups, the Hero and Nama people could also be represented by as many groups as possible. Thank you very much, Esther. I would like, um, before we open it up for the chat, to uh, ask Limbert what kind, now that you've been hearing so many perspectives and also I thought what Esther said about uh, building the bridges outside of her country, outside of Namibia, looking for um, networking in um, Britain, in France, in other countries. What kind of support could be helpful for your organizations and for your aims that you are following? Uh, 
creo que es muy importante eh, hacer un trabajo desde donde estamos. Eh, yo estuve el, hace dos años en Alemania y estuve en Suiza denunciando a Glencore por todo el impacto. Muchas empresas transnacionales vienen a nuestro país, contaminan, hay realmente una vulneración de derechos. Entonces, lo que nosotros queremos en Europa, en Alemania, en, en Bélgica, es desde allí también la sociedad alemana hacer presión a las empresas para que cumplan, hacer presión a, a sus gobiernos para que eh, estas empresas en los lugares donde trabajan puedan respetar los derechos humanos, puedan respetar el medio ambiente. Entonces, eso es muy importante. Hoy nosotros vemos con mucha tristeza que realmente estamos en manos de empresas transnacionales que hacen lo que quieren. Y nosotros también estamos entrando en esa cadena por el consumismo. Todo es consumo, consumo y todo lo que nosotros consumimos viene pues de las materias primas, de la minería, del, del petróleo. Entonces tenemos que también aprender a ser consumidores conscientes. Denunciar a las empresas creo que sería eso la gran tarea entre los diferentes países. Cuestionar este modelo de desarrollo. Entonces creo hay que hacer una articulación a nivel de Europa, a nivel del sur, de América Latina, a nivel de, de todos los países de África. Creo que eh, las empresas transnacionales hoy están en África, hoy están en, la, en Latinoamérica principalmente. Entonces, debemos tener esos lazos de, de, de solidaridad, articularnos, porque creo es muy importante llegar al poder, pero llegas al poder y están por encima las empresas transnacionales. Y a veces son ellos quienes mandan, quienes eh, toman decisiones en contra de nuestro pueblo. I think it's very important to work from where we are. Um, two years ago, I've been to Germany and I've been to Switzerland to accuse the transnational businesses. And uh, many transnational businesses are still coming to Bolivia. And I think that the societies in Europe, in, in Germany and Belgium, for example, they should put pressure on the transnational businesses because uh, they don't respect the environment in our country. And uh, we need to have a global society, a global solidarity in this field because we all consume different goods and these goods come um, partially from our country. So uh, we need to consume, um, we need to be conscious consumers and we need a solidarity um, between Europe, between Latin America and Africa also in this respect to um, put pressure on the transnational businesses. Thank you very much, Limbert. Um, before we open up um, to the chat, because there is some, there are some questions uh, coming in for, for us and we will go on for like 10 or 15 minutes. I would like to, to ask actually all of you, how could this solidarity look like? I mean, um, I think Esther gave some examples what uh, they did and Fahad um, gave some examples how they work. How could this solidarity um, look like Yuri, what um, what do you know about that from your researches in um, Indian movements? Um, how did they network, and was there any solidarity? In fact, I think the point all of the speakers have made today about solidarity has become really important, and the reason it becomes important is for two reasons actually. One, the one Limbert has I think very accurately pointed out, you have a transnational business class. And by a transnational business class, you mean that business is not located only within a country. So for instance, in India more recently, we've had a lot of investment, for instance, from Google, from Facebook, um, who have been investing in very, very large Indian companies who are now trying to become the next Amazon in India. 
Um, and I think a lot of these company heads in India also sit on the boards of companies working in um, owning mines in a lot of um, you know, African countries in Bolivia. And so I think it becomes very, very important when we think of movements within our country to definitely think of solidarities of the working class across country. And the reason I say this, and one thing I think we really ought to talk about a little bit more when we talk about movements is to understand leverage. Because what the business class does often is use people against each other, right? So if you're working, if you have a company in the US, the workers demand high wages, the first thing you're going to do is to say, okay, we're moving to Mexico or we're moving somewhere else or we're moving to India. And of course, the Indian workers will take these jobs because we do need jobs. And so what needs to actually start to happen is for us to recognize um, that some of our struggles have to be more collected and they can't happen unless workers all around the world actually come together and do it together. Otherwise, this playing of people against each other is going to continue to happen. Um, and I think one of the things that the movements have, you know, the movement that, um, that some of the movements that I have sort of known and worked with um, over the many years, one of the things they have tried to do is to understand this, to say, okay, in your country, what are some of the issues? Can we actually, um, you know, also um, lend any support to you on these same issues? And maybe together we can ask for some things like universal basic income, like um, you know healthcare reforms, which workers all around the world, if they don't actually ask together, a company is very easily going to go from say Bolivia, they'll move to another country and exploit another one. It doesn't stop them. And so what we really need to do is recognize these ties and solidarities between them because that is the only thing that will make us come together and fight some of these larger things which go beyond one country. So as you, I understand you, then the distinction between global north and global south, south doesn't make any sense because it's all together. In, well, you're partly right and you're partly wrong, and I'm, that's where I'm going to go back to Esther. So one of the, yeah, well, I mean, you're right about it, right? So Brazil is, has industrialized so much now. Will you call Brazil global south still? Will you call it the global north? Um, the US and India both rely a lot on agriculture. Are we the global north versus south? So in some sense, it's become more difficult to recognize what exactly the global north looks like, what exactly the global south looks like, except for one thing. And I think the only thing, so the, the reason the distinction came about was because there was um, a political scientist called uh, Wallerstein who said, listen, the global South has been made to be marginalized. So the rich are growing rich at the cost of the global South. One of the things that we have to remember about that is the logic. And we have to keep looking even now for institutions that still carry that logic. So for instance, Esther's point, right? About um, the German state and what is happening in terms of um, their interaction with Namibia. But one thing that we have to remember is that this is not only the past history. You have to look at which institutions and which states still have the power to dictate how business happens, um, uh, you know, who has the right to military intervene. You know, so we need to look more critically at institutions like the WTO, like NATO. So the German example is not only from the um, Herrera and Norma, uh, Norma genocide from you know very long ago. It's something that we ought to still looking to keep looking at now. Though we don't have direct colonization, we definitely have some countries and some institutions that still have much more power than other ones. And that's where our alliances also need to come. So, for instance, with Esther's example, we have we, uh, India was colonized by the British. The I mean, of course, you know, the consequences we still see. So the inequalities that Esther talked about with the Herrera and Nama people is something that you also see with some of the um, groups in India. But another thing I want to say is now the nation states themselves have taken on some of these colonial policies. So it's not just the global north, but it's to look at institutions who have power. 
So the state, for instance, is used some of the policies that the British used against the Indians then have now become institutionalized and is a part of our constitution, which the current Indian government is using against activists. And this is um, an anti-sedition law. If they feel like you're speaking against the state, which is what the British came up with, then you have the right by the state to be picked up and arrested. We have hundreds of activists in jail right now with the same law being used. So what we ought to do is be careful and look for these sorts of patterns of the global north, but now just you know patterns of domination everywhere around us and call it out. Thank you very much for this important point. Thank you very much, Lily. I mean, because we are running out of time and there is some questions coming from the chat, I would like really very much to open them and um, try to ask you. I will try to read them. Um, Mia uh, wrote me, uh, there's one question saying, are there certain moments of learning within the social struggles and social protest movements which you could observe? That would be the first part of the question and it goes on and it says, how could possibly those learning processes transform political aims, strategies or alliances? So the first question, is there some learning moments that you can observe? I, I guess, of course you can, um, each one of you, I guess. Who wants to start with that uh, part of the question? Who would like to start? Whether, I'm not so sure whether I get the question, but um, of course, in the process, there are, in every process, in every process, there are learning mo moments. Um, like, for example, when we said that no one knew or very few people knew about that, that was also the movement contributed to creating that knowledge. Um, the learning also at different levels, I, I would say, at, at individual levels, at community levels, at organizational levels, and also at international levels. And I think that is it, what is bringing us to the global solidarity or networking, which is very important because I don't want us only to look at global solidarity as something for, for, for knowing that you are not alone in your fight, but there are others where also. But from an academic point of view also, I think a lot of, uh, it's important for the indigenous knowledge to be published by the people themselves. Because when you look at the books that are there or the literature that are there at the moment, it's written from the perspectives of the colonizers. So it's important also for us that as, 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 as we form this global network to start publishing and to start um, telling our own narratives in our own ways, in our own understandings. And that for me would also be a form of a social learning through these um, movements. I'm not sure whether I answered the question. That was right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. Uh, Esther, I would like to um, put up the second part of the question, which was, which was, how could possibly those learning processes transform political aims, strategies, or alliances? Who would like to answer to that question? Yuri, you want? So, so in fact, one of the biggest learnings and, ha, um, and how it's actually translated into shifting alliances that I've seen is um, when movements come together, when people come together, it's not as simple as we think it is, right? So we are all together in this room right now. Um, it's not always fully easy to completely like see what our common interests are. It looks like, you know, one is from Bolivia, another is from Syria, another is from Namibia, Germany, India. We're like, yeah, I can see some commonalities, but can we actually start working together from tomorrow? And one of the most important things that I've seen is that kind of click happens when you actually start saying, okay, maybe we can start a discussion group together. 
maybe we can start and see where is the first point that we want to think about or take up that could possibly affect all of us. When, when you start to actually kind of take care of some things and start to talk to each other and have these discussions, what suddenly clicks is this learning process where you're like, wow, we're all very similar. There is definitely like what's happening to me right now. I'm like, ah, I can see so many connections. This is so great. And so what that ends up doing is you start finding different ways to support one another. So for instance, Limbert is working with miners in, Columbia, in uh, Bolivia. The mining community has among the most amount of leverage in Bolivia. By leverage, I mean, if you want for any social change to happen, you need to have the power to actually be able to do something, right? So if you're, uh, if you're trying to change your working conditions in a factory, the workers in that factory can stop working and then the management will have to listen to them. Um, and if you're not a worker, the management is going to be like, you can stand all day outside my factory. I don't care about you. The point is all of us bring different kinds of leverage and different kinds of strength. So at different times, what we need to do is to listen to each other. So if there's, for instance, a transnational company also investing in India, they are also investing in Bolivia. What I know is I, I don't have any leverage over the company, but the mining community in Bolivia does. The miners can say, we're not working, we are going to protest, and that can affect the company. So I have seen that happen at a local level too, where they're suddenly like, I don't have the structural power, but these workers do, or these people do. So what I can do is I can support them. And that has led to really beautiful alliances um, building in. So for instance, I'll give you a very quick example is with women. So initially, um, you know, women weren't very big, uh, you know, weren't a very large part of this movement. And suddenly people started to realize, ah, but women are agricultural workers. They do majority of the work in the fields. So they can say, we're not going to work or they can start to fight for wages. And that way, a lot of the other men in the village, a lot of the other people in the village are also going to get involved in this social movement. And through the women, all of these men got involved. They started to take up other issues of water, you know, started to um, take up issues of the environment, you know, other things. And suddenly alliances built, alliances built, and then the movement sort of started to reach out to so many different people who all had different strengths. So that's how the learning process clicks and you kind of end up building alliances because you realize that's the only way. Thank you very much, Yuri. Thank you. I would just like to go on and to put up the next question, which I, which I would like to ask to Limbert or to Fahad. And that is um, someone who's writing, thanks a lot, um, muchismas gracias, Limbert. How can we actually guarantee that your voices are heard a lot more in social movements and in politics in Germany and Europe? And I think, Limbert, of course, this question goes to you, but maybe Fahad, that is also something that you can ask. Uh, answer. Thank you. Sí, eh, muy brevemente, creo la solidaridad es muy importante. Las redes sociales también hoy nos juntan, entonces es muy importante eh, conocer nuestras luchas. Hay muy buenas experiencias en Latinoamérica, en Bolivia, de movimientos ambientales, movimientos por la vida, que están eh, haciendo frente a estas políticas. Entonces creo que los lazos de solidaridad es muy importante. Y también en el norte, en Europa, en Estados Unidos, que también la gente empiece a denunciar a sus propias empresas transnacionales para que cumplan estas empresas transnacionales en los países como el nuestro. Entonces, eh, hay que articular más la lucha y tomando también la identidad, la cultura de los pueblos. Eso es muy importante para fortalecer una lucha, eh, una lucha en pro de la vida, en pro de nuestras generaciones que vienen. In short, I think that we need global solidarity and we are also connected through social networks, which is important to me also. And we should know our struggles. We should know about um, 
our mutual struck, uh, our struggles, and um, it's important that, in, as I already said, that in Europe and in the US, uh, the citizens put pressure on transnational businesses so uh, that our community could thrive and um, we could all stand in solidarity together. Thank you very much, Limburg. Fahad, would you like to add something to that? Or yeah, I mean, uh, th this panel is one or one example, actually, how you can support us. Invite us to, to speak about the local contexts, about the, our demands, about the problems we are facing on a daily basis. Uh, give us the platform, actually, that we are heard by uh, the international community, by the media, by the stakeholders at all. This is one of you know uh, the possibility uh, what everybody in his position and her position can do and can support us. It's not only a case of uh, support through money, through through donation, uh, but also uh, creating platforms, giving giving us the place to be uh, heard, and uh, maybe publishing articles, uh, talking about it, um, uh, organizing uh, meetings and, and events about uh, you know, the different social movements and their demands, and supporting them through um, the channels what everybody can have. If somebody maybe here is hearing us and he is or here, uh, she is uh, um, a member of parliament, she or he can talk this demand to the parliament and talk about it and uh, put pressure on the political uh, parties to uh, talk about this and to talk the foreigner countries and use the power of Germany, for example, to put some countries and some um, military power under pressure to make some movements. So it's a very like an actually an, an a wide range of possibilities, I think, who what, what we actually have here in Germany from individuals, but also from groups, from pro political bar parties, from stakeholders in, in, in general. Uh, so yeah, and we, we are receiving uh, actually a um, lot of support from a different uh, side, but I think as we, we live, especially in Syria, in a very dangerous situation, and we are facing the daily threat actually to be uh, attacked by military powers, if it's by the Syrian regime or, for example, also by Turkey, we still, this support and this solidarity on daily basis. We lost, for example, the last year in October, uh, one of our big centers because the place where we have this, we had this center became uh, a part of the front line. And the possibility to, to launch our other six centers is still there because all those military powers are still trying to gain more, more, uh, more power and to, to win more uh, ground and to push us actually uh, uh, out of, of the country and to, to eliminate us. And this is so the moment actually for, for you to support us and to raise your voice and to say no, this is a massacre who is going to happen and we have uh, people there who are struggling for better life for dignity and this is also our possibility to support them with with the possibilities and with the uh, capacity we have thank you very much Fahad. it feels like to me that uh, we should do this way much more often to come together in rounds like this because that is what you he said that is like really the starting point i mean we were supposed to start to talk about utopias but actually that is i feel the starting point of a new utopia uh, which is a word i can't spell <laughs> as you <laughs> probably realized but i really mean this deeply it's a lot about solidarity connection connection and getting to know what are the struggles in each region also and i feel it's a lot also what Esther brought up and you he brought up and you all brought up to not only look for your our own struggles but also to see that there is a connection between the struggles there and the struggles there and that we can support each other I feel very 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 glad that uh, we came together today I feel like I Max actually wrote me that we have like uh, now maybe two minutes so um 
we're just running out of time, which just passed by time flew. Um, there is some questions in the chat we can't, we will not be able to answer because it would take us another uh, 10, 20 minutes, I feel. But I really would like to thank you very, very much that you have been um, part of this panel. I was super, super happy to have you. And um, I hope this is not the last time that we come together in not maybe the same round, but uh, with one or two or three or four of you. I'm very happy. Yui, thank you very much. Fahad, thank you very much. Limbert as well, thank you very, very much. It worked very well with the translation. I'm very happy how that worked. Very thanks, a big thank you to the interpreter and translator. And thank you very much to Esther as well. And um, to everyone who was listening and looking at us. And I'm a bit sorry that we couldn't answer all the questions that came up from the chat. I would like to say, have a good evening, a good afternoon, and a good weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you.